A little bit about the webinar before we kick it off. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit what marketers need to pay attention to in 2017. Uh, we talk about the marketing and sales alignment. That's a hot topic at the moment. Uh, we cover some of the bases, why it's happening and why it's important. And then we cover a little bit of the basis of uh, account-based marketing and what that means uh, for us marketer, marketers and sales um, and, and some of the companies, obviously, we have to pull together and, and, and make sure that marketing and sales are working together make, to make the best results. Uh, but before we get into the hot topics, I want to kind of hear your story, Mary. Uh, you want to tell a little bit about what you do in everyday life and, uh, and uh, kind of what's your role and who are you? Yeah, fantastic. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Jonas and Timo. It's great to, great to be here and to be able to share some of the things that I'm thinking about and writing uh, for, for your audiences. But uh, to answer your question, so professionally, I'm a, a principal analyst at Forrester Research, which is an amazing company, as you all know, a phenomenal global brand. Mm -hmm. And I work within the group that writes for and advises B2B marketing and sales leaders. And so I spend much of my time doing research, writing reports, advising customers, doing keynote speeches all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the topics that I really cover are helping organizations understand how to optimize their routes to market in the age of the customer, which is a key theme for Forrester. Um, I also spent a lot of time looking at social selling, which I think is going to be a key, key channel for sales and marketing distribution, mm -hmm. as well as relationship extension, not only today, but in the future. And then marketing and sales alignment, I call that the, the topic that just keeps on giving. We've been uh, writing about it for years. Actually, I, I Google searched uh, sales and marketing relationships. And I came out with 98 million topics. Oh, wow. Um, articles like ending the war between sales and marketing, what to do when your sales and marketing relationship sours, uh, and so on and so on. So it's, uh, it's a topic that keeps on giving, but it's so timely now. And... Um, I also spent a lot of time doing research on millennials. Mm. So I just published a report uh, that focuses on millennial B2B buyers. And as you probably know and your audience knows, millennials are going to be about 50% uh, of the global workforce by 2020. And much of the conversation about millennials has really centered on how do we recruit, retain, inspire, um, have yoga classes, raise the mood elevator, keep millennials happy so they want to come work at our mm. firm. But my research right now is really focusing on millennials as buyers. Mm -hmm. And about 73% of millennials say they're involved in their purchasing uh, decisions for their firm. And yet sales and marketing isn't really paying attention to them. So that was a long answer to your question. I am extremely passionate about the work we do at Forrester and my research. Um, that's what I do on a daily basis. And in a personal life, I, I live here in Chicago. If you could see, I'm right on Lake Michigan. It's a gorgeous day here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I... Uh, Run, run and bike by the lake. I'm an amateur triathlete, and I'm coming to Reykjavik this summer to run the marathon. Oh wow! So awesome. If any of your uh, your uh, audience members are there, come seek me out. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, I can imagine like there's so many like high board like okay in Finland. Uh, if you look at the LinkedIn feed, at the yeah. moment. There's nothing but social selling, and and uh, that that's a uh, one topic that uh, we could discuss, but it's not the topic of the webinar. But but I think that's a very interesting point of view that the millennials are actually the buyers. They becoming in few years, they're gonna make a lot of the shots, and they have very different view of the world than some of the. I'm I'm sorry, but the elderly uh, decision makers who are in power right now. Uh, so that's a uh, definitely. I, I could imagine you have quite uh, powerful powerful uh, position in, in, in the B2B marketing field and, and as an expert and as a thought leader. I, I'm, I'm sure that there's so much wisdom right there that we could like to just like quiz out of you. So hopefully we can do a good job with that. Uh, but let me question, ask you a question. Why B2B marketing and, and sales? What got you hooked on that? Yeah, well, um, if some of your, your uh, audience members take a look at my LinkedIn background, you'll see that this is my probably my third or fourth career so I'm a Gemini I'm, I constantly have to be stimulated and I like uh, intellectual curiosity but um, I have a, an immense passion for everything sales and marketing really I just I love it and I think sales 
I got into sales uh, later in my career. It was the second career, and I started out as inside sales. And I've done every role within the sales organization from inside sales to chief commercial officer, chief revenue officer, pretty much everything in between. And so I just think sales is an amazing profession if you are intellectually curious, self-directed, driven, ambitious. And, and I think the same about marketing. If you're you know, analytical and tech savvy and highly collaborative and creative, um, that there, there aren't better fields to be in. And so I just have a personal passion for it. And I also think that we're at a really unique intersection point in time. Um, and there's three kind of legs of the school stool that I think of. It's, you know, this buyer who is becoming so astute, self-directed, independent, um, and demanding, quite frankly. And that's even going to change further as millennials get more and more involved in into the decision-making process. And then you have the maturation of all these tools and technologies that maybe five years ago or seven years ago, just only offered a promise. But now, you know, whether it's um, predictive or AI or other types of tools that are out there, this is phenomenal uh, ability to do collaboration and personalization and have deeper understanding of your buyers. And then from a more pragmatic side, there's just this constant drumbeat of, you know, having to do more with less, right? Driving more and more revenues. When you're in sales, your quotas don't go down every year, they go up. Mm -hmm. And CEOs and CFOs are smart now, and they know um, that with all the tools and technologies that are out there, you can start to do more with less. So there's a constant pressure on sales and marketing. And so I just love working with these leaders and helping them figure out how to do what they do better in ways that uh, are going to resonate more for buyers and bring commercial rewards to their organizations. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's some things that I enjoy as well. I'm, I'm a naturally curious guy as well. And uh, I, I feel like marketing is an animal that it, its be behavior can be changed like overnight. Somebody comes up with something new, they figure out how to push the buttons uh, as in, in copy or images or something, some way, technology, but whatever. You know, and and then suddenly everybody's following. So the chain game changes completely uh, within a night. And 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 then the sales again. I, I think there's tremendous power in that. And I like the Grant Cardone. Uh, he says you you either sell or you be sold. Uh, you're, uh, and 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 that's kind of the, like the truth that we uh, kind of pass sales in in this sort of co concept of uh, or pushing information or trying to people to do something okay that's right but there's so many psychological elements within it and it's like exchange of values i'm trying to pursue my values over your values i'm i'm trying to tell you why they're better than yours and it's, it's kind of like this sort of uh continuous battle and and i think the human psychology element in that is is very very interesting and and i think Sales is one thing that if you master sales, you master the globe. You, you can truly have tremendous power over if, if you can influence people to do what you want. And I, I think that's the way sales should be looked at. Um, not in the evil way, not, 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 you know, the Dr. Evil spokesperson here, but you know, you get the point. It, it's super interesting. Um, and now um, you, you mentioned field changing, uh, customers are getting more demanding. Uh, they have the tools to seek information. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, buyers want to hear from sellers? Uh, yeah. You've done a lot of research on on how they behave, how they seek information, and how they, you know, just yeah. like you said, demand uh, salespeople for change. What do yeah. What do they want? Well, you know, buyers don't want to be told what they already know. So that's the first thing, right? Um, so today's buyers are oftentimes they're starting with search, they're going to social sites to view um, client references, they're downloading white papers, they're looking at, you know, competitors and how they stack up against each other. And so at Forrester, you know, we really look at the, the buyer life cycle, the buyer journey and that early phase is, you know, they um, wanna go and take a self-directed approach, mm. but you know, if you're a seller and you wait till the latter phases of the sales cycle, you're going to, you know, put yourself in a commodity position where it's just a discussion about features and functions and price. So you have to find a way to swoop in in that early section so that you can shape the hearts and minds of the people you're working with and create a shared and collective vision for the solution. But you need to do it in a contextual um, and personalized way. 
And so they don't want to hear about features and functions of the solution, but they want to hear about new ideas. And so I did some research this summer, this past summer with a client, and we went out and we interviewed a lot of B2B buyers and asked them what they wanted and if they would be more likely to buy from a salesperson who had certain characteristics or attributes. And what we found was that buyers wanted to engage with a sales rep who was um, really insightful, data-driven, and flexible. So by insightful, you know, they're teaching me something new. I want to learn learn something new, be told something I hadn't known before. Um, Data-driven, I want to have conversations with my salesperson around how their product or solution is going to measurably impact my business performance. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of flexible, I want them to be able to flip on the fly to talk about what matters to me and my company, not take me through this sort of linear um, sales-oriented static presentation that I don't really care about. So, you know, if you could weave in some customized data you know, into that presentation or be able to dynamically flip to what the customer wants to talk about. That's how they want to engage with sellers. And what we found in the research is that um, buyers, you know, all things being relatively equal in terms of price and, and, and the solution offering, were 75% or more likely to buy from a seller who could engage in that manner. Hmm. Is there, um, Mary, is there a uh as you said, uh, you've been also studying millennials as, as B2B buyers, so, but um, this, uh, these three characteristics, so insightful, data-driven, and then this, uh, that your flexible. context, yeah, and flexible. Uh, is this uh, millennial-specific, or does this concern all of the B2B buyers, independent of their age? Great question. This, so this was done last July, and we didn't slice the demographics by, um, you know, millennials, Gen Xers, or boomers. So it was a general um, B2B buying, buying audience. However, this most recent set of research that I've done that focuses on millennials, which isn't totally a topic for today, but um, they have a very different lens. And we found that... Um, that boomers, you know, want to uh, get references from peers. Uh, they want to get ROI and case studies. They want to see results. And um, Gen Xers want to look at different things. Well, millennials will actually pay more. They're less interested in ROI and business cases. They want to experience trust, authenticity, and feel like, you know, you're an extension of their team, a real business partner. Um, and they're really interested in co-creation, collaboration, and innovation. And we're starting to now see these collaboration sites um, pop up where uh, buyers and sellers can kind of meet on the platform um, and buyers can start to create their own ROI and co-create proposals together. So I'll send you a couple slides from that report um, if you want to share it with your audience and um, really look at the difference, the different lens that millennials have um, relative to boomers and Jack's Gen Xers, and most sales and marketing strategies are designed, as Jonas said, for, for boomers and Xers, uh, younger boomers and Xers. And um, if you don't sort of fine tune, you're going to repel this next generation of buyers. So I think it's really interesting, mm. I guess, as you can tell. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's interesting that they're completely human centric. And I, I don't know what is the behavioral uh, driver behind that. Is, is it the social networks and, and, and you know, the type of uh, interaction that they used to have and they uh, for example look at the snapchats and the vlogs that the younger audiences have grown up with it's very personable and very approachable and authentic and i think those are the kind of uh, when we think about video uh, in itself as a medium it's always been about being real like nobody wants to be you know, hearing uh, even on video, they don't want to hear or be told what to do. They want to kind of feel that somebody's in the same situation and, and they got over it. And, you know, that's empowering and I want to do that, too. So uh, that's very interesting to see how, how, how you know, that's a huge um, behavioral difference. Uh, yeah, you know, numer numeric, uh, human centric, like this sort of. That's very interesting. We have to uh, get back to that. But um, let's move in on to the sales and marketing alignment. Uh, we know now what the buyers want and how they behave and they go online and they look for information. They want to do it individually and uh, personally. And then when they're ready, they'll move in and they let us know when, when it's okay to move towards them. Uh, but what 
and why is the marketing and sales alignment needing our attention at the moment? Like, wh how does that help us uh, be successful in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. And so I think, um, you know, we've been talking about it for many, many years, but I think it's more crucial now. And, you know, in the past, I thought that marketing and sales alignment was more of a CEO driven mm. initiative. And now I feel like the buyer is really mandating it, mm. as you can tell from some of my research. And what happens, I think, now is that if sales and marketing are operating in a siloed approach, mm. they're going to get left behind by today's buyers. And so in order to keep pace and engage with buyers the way they're demanding, sales and marketing have to come together, mm. whether that's with ABM and you know really having a very, very narrow target market and having personalized uh, engagements with that market, whether it's with social selling where marketing and sales are collaborating together on the right types of content across the buyer life cycle, um, or maybe it's just having a rich data strategy so that you can really understand the kinds of activities and behaviors that buyers are doing um, out there that can indicate whether or not it's time for them to purchase your solution. So. I think that sales and marketing is coming together. We're seeing it in a lot of the data already at the C-suite. You're starting to see CMOs get compensated on the variable part of their compensation on um, revenue growth and profits. Mm. And um, I think we now need to start to see organizations drive more compensation and metrics downstream mm. um, to continue to bring these guys together. But the reality is if sales and marketing don't get their act together and start working really closely together in ways they never have done before, um, their businesses will get disintermediated by by others that do, mm. um, because the marketplace is so challenging right now. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. the technology is there. Sorry, Timo, for shouting over you, <laughs> but I think the technology is already there. So I think, <laughs> and and what do you think? What are the, some of the challenges? Why sales and marketing don't get along? It's like a, a, a schoolyard, like lower grade schoolyard. You know, there's the bullies and the, you know, uh, yeah. why is it so hard to align marketing and sales? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think about that question frequently. I, I also teach at, at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, and that's the next generation of business leaders. And, and those folks ask me that question all the time. They work at big companies, companies like Kraft and you know Motorola and others. But um, I think it's fundamentally that sales and marketing have a different view of the world, right? Um, they have different DNA. There's just a different personality makeup. Salespeople, in my experience, and I apologize for generalizing because not everyone is like this, but, you know, are high risk, high reward, um, you know, people that uh, are willing to take uh, risks both in their personal lives and their business. Marketers like more predictability um, in the work environment. Sales is okay with uh, big swings in, in income, and marketing wants more of sort of a, a predictable, um, you know, engagement. You know, oh. I, I've, uh, I, I, having been in sales, I've, I've made, you know, tons and tons of money in, in unique years. And then I've been fired, you know, three or four times. And that's part for the course, right? Because the average lifespan of a chief revenue officer is, what, 18, 24 months? Mm. Um, and, you know, you didn't negotiate a great parachute and, and then you go off to Mexico and hang out. <laughs> and, uh, right. Mm, I mean, right. it's just the way it is. You have to accept it. Mm. Um, but that's not for everybody. Mm. Um, and so I do think that there's a real difference in how we view the world. Um, but I'm starting to see innovative organizations like people in marketing start to go into sales and see people in sales go into marketing. And I think, you know, as the selling role changes over time. Um, some of the skills that are required to be a strong marketer are going to be required to be a great seller. Mm. Some of those micro market, you know, micro marketing skills and the ability to do analytics and to understand technologies. Sellers are going to, in the future and also today, need to be able to start to um, include those uh, skills into their overall uh, profiles. Mm. Mary, uh, just referring to something that you said before about this, uh, that uh, some of the CMO compensation has been tied to the some of the downstream downstream funnel metrics. Yeah, uh, that's uh, I think completely new idea still in Finland at least. Um, so, uh, on what, what's your uh, like uh, best guess about estimation that um, what percentage of of uh, the maybe Fortune 100 companies and CMOs over there already have like this type of uh, incentives or or uh, 
Yeah, so um, most of the, the CMOs, um, I don't have the, the stat with me right off the top of the head, my head, but most of the CMOs and the big companies here now are getting um, their, their variable portion of their compensation tied to revenue attainment and profits. And so um, I'll, I'll have to follow up with you on the exact stat, but, you know, it's in the 60 to 80 percent range. Yeah, well, I think the ballpark estimate is already like, a, but I, I'd say that Finland, it's... it's uh, Closer to maybe twenty, yeah, bit <laughs> twenty even. So I think it's, it's kind of a new new idea still here. So, so that's a really a, an important first step, as because as you look at, you know, the buyer's not going through a linear sales um, progression anymore, right? It's this, you know, series of um, interactions, right? Whether they're digital or in person, and they're not linear. They want this holistic experience, and so the concept of uh, marketing sort of generating demand, creating an MQL, passing it off to sales, sales qualifying, that's not really the way buyers are buying anymore. So to um, continue to pay marketing on, you know, qualified leads or whatever it is, doesn't necessarily make sense with a modern buyer. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's sort of how we're thinking about it. Now, where we haven't seen much progress is down at the you know, um, mid-level management on marketing, they're still, you know, not tied to revenue for the most part. I would say one to two percent might be, um, but there's much more that can be done um, to align metrics and compensation at the mid-level between marketing and sales, and I think it should be done. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, monetary incentives, of course, um, well, they shouldn't be the only reason to, to work, but anyway, it's, it's a really good way to direct the work or <laughs> you know um, direct the work to a certain direction when with, yeah. with incentives so yeah, yeah. It, i mean there's intrinsic and extrinsic rewards and business leaders need to drive both and everyone's motivated differently but at the end of the day the marketing and sales compensation plans should be a way to operationalize mm -hmm. the business strategy and it's a compensation i think is an underutilized lever that business leaders should be doing more more with and more cre having more creativity around. Hmm. Maybe it's a maybe it's a report in the future. Who knows? Yeah, that, interesting thoughts. Very interesting thoughts. I, I like. I think that's a completely on topic. How to uh, kind of restructure some of the company operations based on on the incentives and all, all that. That's a very interesting uh, kind of conversation to have in the future, especially when we talk about the mid levels. Uh, right. You said something about you know buyers not buying linearly, uh, linearly any, anymore. This and th this kind of like looks, um, it's jumpy, it's messy, it, it's irrational almost. There's a uh, and 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 you know the generating leads is not the best way to measure your uh, success. Uh, you mentioned ABM, which is account-based marketing. Uh, how do you how would you define account based marketing? Yeah, so um, we actually at Forrester, a collection of analysts last year wrote four reports on ABM just because it was a really hot topic and um, we wanted to put a stake in the ground in terms of how we think about it. So um, my colleague Laura Ramos came up with this definition and this is how we define it at Forrester. It's a strategy where marketing and sales jointly obsess over how to pursue, establish, and grow long-term, highly engaged revenue relationships with customers. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but mm -hmm. um, spent a lot of time really kind of distilling that definition um, to come up with it. Okay, so sales and marketing together pursuing uh, long, long-lasting customer relationships. Uh, uh, how is that? Is that basically the final uh, nail into the coffin of? Uh, uh, traditional lead generation or how, how do you feel about like is there still space for you know these ebooks and whatever or is that account based yeah. do you feel like that's the future or how, how do you see this uh, game changing yeah well i mean you know i kind of think that this this traditional ebooks and downloading and having sales call hey i saw you downloaded a white paper mm. i mean that's done and done mm. right in, in 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 my way in in, in my mind and I think as we move forward, everything I hear is about really personalization, mm. right? Um, and the big challenge to date has been, how do you do personalization at scale? Mm. And Jonas, you mm. mentioned that, you know, 
there's a lot of technologies out there and there are tools now that actually do work that allow for this. And so we're seeing a lot of the companies that we work with um, really narrowing their focus, narrowing their target list. And I was with a company here in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a customer loyalty company. And I met with their enterprise um, sales team. And it really consisted of CRO, uh, head of marketing, another marketing person, and one other salesperson. Um, and they're going to do multiple seven-figure deals this year um, with a very small kind of sm SWAT team taking a very, very personalized approach um, to the companies that they're going after. And so I think that's essential. Hmm. Um, as you think about how we went to market in the past, it was volume-based, right? Volume metrics. Sales was always looked at, you know, how big is my territory? How many meetings do I have? You know, how, how many deals am I going to close? Everything is around volume. I mean, I think that was how, how we were sort of wired. Hmm. But now I don't think it's about volume. And I think the new currency is attention. And by that, I mean, how do we get the attention of our prospects and customers? And so you get the attention by, you know, doing research and listening on social, by partnering with marketing to come up with highly customized messaging, by doing events that um, uh, are high value, that include thought leaders and um, maybe even have a component of um, augmented reality or virtual reality where you might be able to try and test a solution. So it's about how do I get and sustain attention of the key contacts that I want to work with um, versus really going out and kind of spraying the market with your messaging. Um, I think that's the way of the future, and we're already seeing innovative companies operate that way here in the States. Mm. Um, I like the yeah, I like um, the basic suggestion of of uh, ABM uh, because um, I think it's the or the basic idea that uh, it brings first of all marketing and sales around the same table and the first question that they should ask about that or ask themselves is that uh, who are the customers that are really valuable for this company and, right at, and at the very end game so uh, mm. and in the revenue. Revenue and of of course profitability way as well, and um, then asking that question together, which which brings a lot of focus. So it's it's as you said, it's not the spray and pray and, and volume thing, but rather than focusing on something first, and after that they, the second question to ask is then, uh, what and where and when can we do something together so that uh, we can bring in these customers, or or you know communicate to these customers in a way that we are providing value and uh, creating long-term relationships. So I think it's a, uh, or I think ABM for myself has been the first time when I, I have uh, started thinking about selling and marketing this way. So I think there that's the reason why I'm so enthusiastic about this. Yeah, me too, me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um I would be interested to kind of hearing if you have any good cases to mention, like uh, who who's done it right. Um, yeah. Like like, uh, like you said, these are kind of like uh, micro efforts. Uh, I I could see like a salesperson uh, activating his LinkedIn profile, starting right articles, and then marketing takes that uh, article and sponsors it so that the right people see like these sort of micro events, uh, collaboration. But uh, do you have any good cases that we could go and see online? Who's doing it right? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a company uh, based in Chicago. It's called Cleversafe, and I'm friendly with the CEO. Um, his name is Chris Gladwin, and he comes to speak at my class, and he really demonstrates sort of the concept of not only marketing and sales alignment, but how mm. powerful it is when you understand every activity that your prospects and customers are having, every interaction um, with you, whether it's on the website, whether it's on mobile, whether it's with sales, whether it's with marketing. And so his company, uh, Cleversafe, is a cloud-based data storage company. And when they were starting up in, uh, you know, several years ago in the earlier days, um, companies were very skeptical about uh, storage in the cloud, and particularly companies like FinServe and others where, you know, there's uh, highly sensitive information. And so Chris's company had a very, very narrow target market at that time. And because of that, I think he was forced to really bring sales and marketing together at a time when no one else was doing it and to really understand every type of interaction 
um, that was happening from, you know, uh, their behavior, their IP addresses and so on and so forth. Um, and he did an amazing job and, you know, sales and marketing would sit next to each other. They'd go out to lunch. I asked him, how do you, you know, how did you do it? He said, I would never hire sales and marketing leaders that weren't, you know, fully committed to working collaboratively. And it was essential um, because they couldn't burn through their territory. There was nowhere else to go to. They had a finite territory. Well, last year, uh, the company got picked up and acquired by IBM for over a billion dollars. Nice. So, um, you know, check out CleverSafe. They're now part of the IBM portfolio. And I'm sure if you Google Chris Gladwin, you'll see the next company that he's working on. Mm. That sounds a lot of... Um, I met Brent Cooper, who, who wrote the Lean Entrepreneur book with Eric Ries. And uh, yeah. he, he talks about the, you know, the problem team and the solution team. And, and yeah. uh, it sounds a lot of, like the, the ABM could take uh, learning from that and just kind of like putting sales and marketing together and figure out what are the, some of the challenges that we face on, on field every day, uh, list them out, and then have a separate team uh, with marketing and sales and possibly some other leadership positions figure out how to fix that. How, how can we uh, approach the right people? What can we do together to get their attention? How do we keep the attention? How do we get them to uh, move forward in, in the final uh, by by customizing and personalizing our messaging and, and all that. That's a very interesting thought, you know, because even when we speak, we talk about marketing and sales as a separate, you know, it, it silos them unconsciously, uh, even when we talk about it. So that's kind of already putting um, sticks into the wheel. I don't know what the saying in, in, in English is, but you, you get the point that, you know, the it makes a rough road. Uh, so yeah. what would be kind of, last advice uh, for for some of the companies uh, where to start is it like starting to come in lunches or is there other other ways of uh, building that relationship and kind of breaking the silos and start talking about we instead of uh, you and I yeah the, I think there's lots of ways I mean I think the first thing is the acknowledgement that um, across the board at the company from the executive level all the way down that a status quo approach to going to market isn't going to work in this environment. Mm. So you have to recognize and acknowledge that and accept it. And then once you've accepted it, it's time to embrace um, new constructs, new ways of organizing. Maybe inside sales or the remote sellers or digital sellers should report to marketing instead of sales, right? Mm. Um, think about creative ways to pay marketing and sales so that they are more aligned. Um, and certainly, you know, the team building activities um, and, and, and having marketing and sales sit close together if you're actually working um, in a site location. Those are the kinds of things that are obvious. But what I like to think about is all of that is still somewhat theoretical. And, you know, having been in C, I'm always thinking about, you know, the operational piece of it. And I think the best way to really bring marketing and sales together is to pick an initiative mm -hmm. that matters for the company that would have significant impact from a revenue standpoint that also creates a better experience for the buyer and pick that initiative and do a pilot group and start working in on it and bring marketing and sales together on behalf of the buyer mm. to generate more revenue for the customer. And then that takes it from a theoretical academic discussion to, hey, shit, we just closed a million dollar deal, um, which really is the best way to bring everybody together when you know, you're celebrating wins and doing great things for customers. So. Mm. You know, some of those initiatives I've highlighted, I think ABM is a great one. So, you know, you maybe you pick a small group or a territory or region and, you know, pick three to five accounts and, and do a pilot. Or maybe you do the same thing with social selling. Or maybe you find some other initiative that makes sense for your business, but wrap it around the buyer, the customer, and revenue attainment. Um, and I think that makes it real and exciting. Awesome. Good, good, good. Good advice. Um, to close off, uh, do you have, Timo, any questions? Uh, anything come to mind? Actually, I had one, one uh, that popped in my mind very in the very beginning because you thought about you were studying millennials as B2B buyers. So what has been or what are some of the most surprising differences that you have found when you have been studying millennials uh, as opposed to Gen Xers or baby boomers? <clears throat> yeah, I think um, it, I did find a lot of surprising things and then some things that, you know, are not surprising. And I think you kind of touched on it. The biggest surprise to me was how important the relationships 
are for millennials. And I think, you know, we there's some stats that say, you know, 85% of millennials are on social networks. And actually, I think somewhere in the range of 25% of millennials spend more than three hours a day on social sites. Um, and I think we all have this concept of the heads down generation as being sort of disconnected and um, only engaged with their digital devices. And, and that, that may be true, but there's a real hunger um, and desire for connection mm. and relationships mm. and trust and authenticity. Mm. And that can come through digital channels and that can come through personal channels. Um, but I think it's, um, that was what was surprising for me. And then as you think about that in the sales or the business setting, um, relationships really matter, mm. but it's not in sort of the traditional way. I had one uh, person that I interviewed, he said, you know, it's not a steak and martini crowd, um, but relationships really do matter. So, you know, maybe it's doing a lunch and learn on site. Maybe it's going for a bike ride or doing an Orange Theory fitness class. Mm. Um, and then, you know, building that relationship over time. So I think that was the, how, how much millennials put on authenticity, trust, relationship and connection. Mm. Um, something mm. that really pleasantly surprised me and mm. made me feel great mm. about that generation. Last question, where can people find you online and where they can follow you? Yeah, great question. I'm really active online. So um, my Twitter handle is uh, at Shay, S-H-E-A, four, F-O-R-R. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very available. I'm posting um, active all the time. And um, my Forrester email is mshea at forrester.com. Awesome. Awesome. Go and follow and uh, give some thumbs up and re retweets and shares and all that. Uh, I'm, I'm, thank you. This has been super cool uh, to have you here and uh, a lot of good insights. And uh, what I'm going to take away is one that you said sometimes the tip of the iceberg is just the tip of the iceberg. There you go. And with that, <laughs> and with that, I will say good night, Bye, or guys. good evening, or good day. Have a great All day. right, thank you. Great to see you. Yep. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye.